far as the camera goes? Yeah. Awesome. All right, welcome all dozen of you. Um, I'm Aaron Gustafson. I am one of the group managers of the Web Standards Project. Um, I also run a little uh, design and development firm called Easy Designs based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about WASP, but more about the Web Standard Sherpa project, which we just launched uh, this past March at, at South by Southwest. So how many of you are familiar with the Web Standards project? Like three of you. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of history here, and then this will kind of make sense. So the Web Standards project was the, uh, the first organization to really say, hey, the, sta the, the state of things during the browser wars really sucks. You know, we've got Netscape over here doing their own thing. We've got Microsoft over here doing their own thing. We're having to write really gnarly, gnarly HTML and really, really gnarly JavaScript in order to be able to actually um, accomplish anything in the browser. And things need to be better. So, you know, if you, I imagine most of you are, were probably on the web during the, uh, the late 90s. And it was horrible, wasn't it? It was absolutely awful. It would be as though you were a television producer and each television manufacturer out there was putting out a TV with completely different dimensions. You know, some were in three by four, some were in, you know, nine by two or something like that. And then you, know, you have the crazy widescreen. We have it a little bit now, but at least, you know, now they've kind of converged on some common standards, but we didn't have any of that on the web. So this great group of people got together and said, you know, enough's enough, this is not, not good. We need to advocate for some sort of standard that everybody follows so that we can actually do stuff on the web easily and it'll make our lives easier. Okay, pretty, pretty good, uh, good goal. So they started working to get the message out and to galvanize other people. Um, they'd spread the word to anybody who would, who would listen to them basically that, you know, trying to tell them, hey, if we get these browser manufacturers to all agree on a set of standards, then, and to actually follow those standards, since a lot of them were involved in the W3C and the creation of the standards, um, if we get them all to actually follow those standards, your job will be easier, and that's a big selling point. So we spread the word to all those people, and we led browser upgrade campaigns. One of them was to, uh, to actually search to see if the browser supported document.getElementById, a fairly basic level of JavaScript, right? Um, so we would actually check to see whether that was supported, and if that wasn't supported, the browser upgrade campaign said you should shunt that person to another web page that tells them that they should, they're using an outdated browser and that they should upgrade that browser. Um, in hindsight, probably not the best tactic to take, but, um, but it worked, it started people uh, moving beyond Netscape 4.7, for instance, which was one of our, uh, our major pains in the ass at that point. Um, so that was part of what we did. We also began to take browser tasks for their sins against web standards. So, you know, they, they're aware, as, you know, Microsoft has been for a really long time, about the W3C event model, for instance. So a, a particular way of assigning JavaScript events uh, within the browser, a standards-based way to do that but Microsoft for a long time has used its own proprietary event model. So we were constantly nagging it at Microsoft and constantly nagging at um, Netscape and later Mozilla um, and, and such to try and get them to adopt the standards that they were actually ratifying within the W3C, within the World Wide Web Consortium. So we also began to kind of chastise the, the tool makers. So the people, you know, Macromedia who made Dreamweaver um, we began to kind of chastise them, but also work with them to make their software more standards compliant to produce better code. Um, and strangely enough, kind of a, a consequence of that, um, it required us using the, uh, it required the creation of the doc type switch, which switches you from quirks mode to standards mode because so many people were using Dreamweaver and using standards without actually realizing they were using standards and they were just coding to IE, you know, 5.5 or something like that. And, so they got the box model wrong, and there was a whole, whole big thing about that. But anyway, we managed to get all of these software vendors to start to support standards. You see them in uh, Expression Web as well if you're more of a Microsoft Tools fan. Um, and we still continue to have a good working relationship with Adobe um, as they continue to, to develop Dreamweaver. So in a lot of ways, we were making a lot of good progress in terms of browsers really adopting standards, especially once like Firefox came out and they really started pushing the envelope and then we got Safari, and then kind of out of the WebKit world, we got Chrome. 
Um, and Opera has always been, you know, kind of on the on the sidelines pushing for for standards, especially in the world of CSS, being that their uh, their founder was one of the the co-creators of CSS. So in a lot of ways, you know, we kind of felt like we were winning the the war uh, for web standards. But there still remained a ton of sites that were being built built that did not actually follow web standards. So they didn't work across browsers or you know they they weren't very semantically marked up so they weren't very you know very good for search engines and such as well or they weren't accessible so people with disabilities were not able to access the content um, and we began to wonder because a lot of this kind of winning uh, not to quote Charlie Sheen but a lot of this came out you know a lot of this happened in kind of the, the early 2000s and you know, at that point, we thought we were in really good shape, and we were kind of began to rest on our laurels. Um, and you know, the reason that that happened is because it kind of became an echo chamber. Everybody that we were talking to had already been kind of had already bought into the gospel of web standards that web standards were this this great thing that was going to save us all. Um, but we had been preaching, you know, to to only those people, and there are so many other people out there on the web that we weren't reaching, right? So this was a really big problem, and. It's something that over the, the intervening years had made the Web Standards Project not all that relevant anymore, which is probably the reason that a lot of you haven't heard of us. Um, so, because we, we used to do great stuff, but then you know we just kind of sat around and you know talked amongst ourselves about things. So, in the last I would say two and a half years, maybe three years, uh, we've been making a concerted effort to change that, to make ourselves more relevant, and to also try and reach the people that we have not traditionally reached. So the, uh, the first way that we did that was to create the Interact Curriculum Framework. So the Interact Curriculum Framework is a framework for creating educational materials, so for creating coursework and such. Um, and the entire idea behind it was to help professors who are teaching the web to keep their, um, their curriculum updated and to keep it adhering to the standards so they're following the best practices, they're teaching their students the best practices, and then the next generation of web folks automatically knows the best practices. They don't know the old ways of you know, table-based layouts and stuff like that that none of us should be doing. Um, so we launched the Interact Curriculum Framework, um, I guess two years ago now, um, and it's been very successful. We've had a lot of um, universities signing on to it. Kind of out of that endeavor came uh, OWEA, which is the Open Web Education Alliance, which was done in partnership with the W3C and several browser makers, including Opera um, and Mozilla, uh, as well as folks from Yahoo and the like. Um, so that was one end, trying to educate the next generation of developers, designers and developers. The kind of next way that we began to, uh, to reach out, and this is a, a more recent project, was the small business outreach. So the idea behind the small business outreach is that, um, and this, this site should be coming out next month, um, is that we begin to reach out to small businesses who are you know, not only drivers of our economies internationally, but also produce a hell of a lot of sites online, right? And most of them are really crappy. Um, and it's not their fault. Most small business owners do not have the time or the knowledge to be able to actually make informed decisions about who they're hiring. Um, to do their web work, whether it's you know somebody to hire internally to their team, or whether it's somebody that they're hiring as a, an outside firm to do their website. So what the Small Business Outreach plans to do is to, our first kind of product is an interview guide, which will help small business owners to actually ask good questions of potential vendors or potential hires, um, and then be able to gauge their responses not in a very prescribed way, but in a here are indicators of a good response, here are indicators of a poor response sort of way so that they can hopefully make better decisions about who they're hiring. And one of two things will happen. Either they will only hire people who are you know, web standards and best practices savvy, or um, and in, in which case the people who are not are either going to have to, uh, are, are not going to be getting work and may get out of the business, or the people that they're exposing to web standards via this kind of Q&A sort of setup um, are going to be exposed to it and realize that they have to learn that in order to get more jobs and in order to continue to stay in the web business. So hopefully they begin to retool because those are the people we haven't reached. You know, those are the people who are not constantly updating their skill set. So the uh, small business outreach is kind of the, the second part of, of what we're doing. And then the third part is what I'm actually here to talk to you about today, which is the web standard Sherpa.
All right, so Web Standard Sherpa, which is webstandardsherpa.com, which I'll throw up at the end here. Um, here's the site. The idea behind Web Standard Sherpa is that it's a place to aggregate best practices, right? So it's a repository for best practices for working on the web. And it'll be kind of a living, breathing site um, in terms of constantly updating if you know, advice that we have given previously becomes outdated. Um, we have ways to mark that so that it, it indicates that this practice has is kind of fallen out of favor and has been supplanted by this new technique so that we never end up in a situation where we're putting out information that's stale, right? So we planned for that for the beginning because the web moves really fast. Um, so the way that we go about doing this is actually through critiquing real world sites. And so it's the equivalent of you sitting there coding a site and having somebody like Dan Rubin on your shoulder and saying, you know, hey, you should be limiting the number of fonts that you're using. Or perhaps it's Jared Spool over your head saying that, you know, good design disappears, basically. And, you know, it's, to us, it's, it's critiques. It's also sort of a, a mentoring thing as well. So, as I mentioned, the whole thing is based around these critiques or reviews as, as we term them in the site. And these critiques are very focused. So for instance, the, the very first one that we posted was from Erin Kassane, who is actually a content strategist, right? She has nothing to do with you know, which version of HTML you're using or whether you're using your CSS right. She has, she, her main concern is the content of your website and how helpful that is to your users, how, how that's serving your users' needs. So you know, in, in the interest of eating our own dog food, we put the web standard Serpa site up you know, for her to critique. And she found quite a few things wrong with it, as we expected. Um, so the reviews actually go through and examine, if I can get it to slide up, all right, examine specific aspects of the site. So in this case, you know, she pointed out that the, uh, you know, the various kind of blurbs that we had about the, the different projects that are going on were inconsistent in that they didn't always have a byline and a date, for instance. She also pointed out things like, you know, this particular, the small business outreach section, we hadn't actually posted anything since, uh, what is that, August, uh, August 5th of 2010. So it had been a considerable amount of time. So seeing that, she said, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense to actually put dates on there because you're automatically showing people that your content's stale. So making very, you know, directed statements about, you know, what we could do to actually improve the overall experience of using our page. Uh, our homepage in this case. Each of the articles um, may have an extra mile, going the extra mile section, where it actually talks about, you know, kind of taking, taking things from the baseline that we discuss in the critique and taking it to the next level. So how to make things even better. And I'll, I'll kind of walk through a few examples um, in a minute. We also include pitfalls to avoid so that you kind of have a bulleted list at the end. Um, that kind of summarizes some of the, the key points of the article so that you know, it's the sort of thing that you could skim it. And, and most of these are literally under 1,500 words, so they're you know, a 10-minute read. Um, we, we're trying to keep them focused in that way so that they can actually be useful to you guys. Um, but then it all gets boiled down to these you know, pitfalls to avoid, you know, quick, quick things to, to skim over that you can you know, put to use right away, and then things that you should actually do. And then we wrap it up if there is related reading that we would suggest that you, you know, that you go to to dig deeper into a particular subject. These are articles that we would suggest or presentations that were given that we would suggest that you go and take a look at. And then finally, we lead into a discussion that we want to have with you about the article or about a particular subject that was um, brought up by that review. Um, so in this case, Aaron asking how you how do you handle content challenges beyond the initial creation? In other words, once you've created the content, how do you maintain it? You know, what, are, what are you working on? You know, what, what mechanisms do you have in place to manage that sort of thing? And all of our articles are kind of structured in this way. And so we lead into to a discussion where we're, you, know, you have kind of the, the Sherpa's ear, you know, be it Aaron Kassane or Jared Spool or Dan, Daniel Rubin or myself, um, being able to kind of answer your further questions, right? So before I uh, kind of move on, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other articles that, that we have up. Um, Web Standard Sherpa is not, as you can see by this example, not just about the spec, but we do deal with spec type stuff. So the first article that I wrote for Web Standard Sherpa was about Twitter.com. 
and looking specifically at the tweet box that we all know and love on Twitter.com, on specifically new Twitter.com, and how, the, how they had implemented it in terms of markup and whether, whether that's the most accessible way to do it or whether there's some way to improve it. So for instance, the form that they use, they have the you know, what's happening statement, which is actually the label for the, the text area, but it wasn't actually marked up in a label element. A label element is used to associate a, piece of, a string of text with a given form control. So the recommendation was that they go back and actually make that a label. It wouldn't adjust the way that it looks or anything like that. You could still have the, uh, the H1, I think, that's inside of it, inside of the label element or the label inside of the H1. But from an accessibility standpoint, when somebody clicks into that field, that label would actually be read out to them. Taking it the next step, we, I started talking about the, uh, the, count, the counter that tells you how many characters you have left, right? So the counter is great and all, because it you know, kind of gives you feedback as you're going, but users don't have, users who use assistive technologies, for instance, screen readers, don't have real access to that information. That, that counter doesn't really provide them any, any more info. info. Um, in the markup, it's actually just, uh, it's actually an input that has the number inside of it. So this naked number 140, what does that even mean, right? It gives you no context. So my recommendation was to move it out of an input, first of all, into normal text, um, and have it be followed by text that said characters remaining, so that that actually gets read out to a user, right? Um, so we're providing more context to that. that. That text can be hidden using CSS very easily, but it can still be read out to the, the user using assistive technology. Um, and then kind of the next step beyond that in the be going the extra mile section, um, I talked about how they could use YARIA, which is the Accessible Rich Internet Applications spec, um, which includes something called Live Regions, which allows you to give updates as to what's going on in a specific section of the page when a user may not be aware of it, to actually read out to a user as they're typing how many characters they have left. And there's a, a video demo of how that works um, up on the site that actually was, was shot from IE9 using the uh, NVDA screen reader, which is a free screen reader. It's fairly nice. Um, so that's another example of, uh, of how, how our reviews are focused. Um, Jared Spool, for instance, also did an, an article where he was talking about the use of the term products in navigation. Um, the specific site that he used to kind of jump off from was a site called Snow Dragon. And uh, Snow Dragon makes snow melters. So these giant heating vats, basically, that you can dump snow into and it gets melted and, and goes down the, the uh, probably the wastewater system or something like that. But you come to their site, and their navigation is products. And then when you mouse over it, it's a drop down, and it's all product codes. So you know, if, you're, if you're someone who runs a, um, you know, the, the Department of Public Works or something like that for a small town, and you're coming to that site, those, number, you know, those product numbers and such are meaningless to you. That, you know, it doesn't tell you anything. So he used that kind of as a, a stepping point to say, you know, if, you're, if all you sell are snow melters, right? Why not say snow melters instead of products? You're not obscuring or obfuscating the, uh, the content that you've actually got on your site. You're also making it more search engine friendly. Um, similarly, for the aid of your users, why not, you know, if you've got all these different model numbers, maybe those you know, break down into some you know, specific things like small municipalities or you know, here's, here's something that specifically if you run a venue, for instance, and you just need to clear a small parking lot, um, you know, different categories as opposed to these just you know, generic model numbers. And then he, he goes and continues to show how those examples, um, how there's parity with other sites such as Weber uh, or Verizon Wireless. And then kind of turns it around and says, you know, if you go to the, the HP site or the Apple site, you actually see that all of their navigation is based on the products that they're actually selling. So whether it's Mac, or whether it's iPad, iPhone, that's the navigation. The products are the navigation. Um, and HP has very similar things with you know, tablet and phone and such like that so that you can get directly to the type of products that you, uh, you're interested in. Um, Dan Rubin's first article went through the process of, um, of looking at charitable organizations and how they, um, how they solicit donations online and ways that you can improve that. Uh, Derek Featherstone actually covered how we can use keyboard controls within uh, an interface. He was using JetBlue in this, 
in this instance. Um, JetBlue, if you're unaware, is actually currently um, the subject of a lawsuit regarding accessibility from the uh, National Federation for the Blind. Um, Target was the, uh, the target of a similar lawsuit and actually ended up shelling out about $10 million for something that probably would have cost about 2000 to fix. Um, so simple problems that could be fixed. But anyway, so Derek, Derek's examining JetBlue um, and kind of went through how just trying to book a, a flight using the keyboard was fairly impossible because they had things like keyboard traps. So if you went from, let's say, your initial destination or your, your from location to your destination and then moved to the travel date, you couldn't actually move to the return date because you were stuck in essentially a keyboard trap. So if you tried to tab out of that field, it wouldn't actually work. Um, and so he talks about how, how to avoid trapping focus and, and how to ensure that your users can actually move through your site using a keyboard, which is beneficial both for non-sighted users who are using a screen reader or other such assistive technology, but also useful for power users because there are a lot of people who prefer not to touch the mouse when they're browsing the website. Um, so again, just a few examples of the sorts of content that we're doing. We're not just looking at the spec. We're looking at overall best practices. How can we improve um, the way all of us do our work? Because you know, in my mind, you know, the a rising tide lifts all boats. So you know, we, we want to be able to improve everyone's skills. The, uh, the team I just kind of want to briefly introduce you to, um, Steph Troth, pictured up here on the, uh, the upper left, is our editor-in-chief. And Chris Casciano and Ben Hennick are uh, two other WASP members that are our um, technical editors. And then our current batch of Sherpas includes Aaron Kassane, Dan Rubin, Jared Spool, myself, and uh, Derek Featherstone. So we have people from the content world, people from the UX world, uh, designers, and then Derek and I kind of pinch hit in a lot of areas. Derek's focus is mainly accessibility, but he also knows a heck of a lot about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, similarly, I'm kind of a, a jack of all trades. Um, and Microsoft very kindly stepped up and actually sponsored the majority of this project um, when we were kind of in a, in a very informal conversation when I brought up this project. They were extremely enthusiastic about it. Um, so they actually gave us the money to not only build the site, but to fund, uh, fund it for the first year. Um, and then Mozilla said that they would, would happily step up and, and help support us. So we do have backing from a lot of the browser vendors, though they're not uh, pressuring our content in any direction. Um, and Media Temple and Expression Engine are kind of our, our technical partners that have helped us out. And then um, Opera and the W3C don't have money to give us, but they happily support us in other promotional ways. Um, so that's kind of the spiel about Web Standard Sherpa. Um, so I wanted to, uh, to kind of open up the, uh, the floor to you guys to see if there are any questions that I can answer for you, um, any comments that you want to, uh, to give about the site. I can walk you through the site if you like. Um, but I figured I can open it up to you guys. Any questions? What the heck is that? That's my question. Sounds like some crazy machinery over there. OK, if you ask a question, I'll give you a button. Can you come up to the mic? Or two, if not many people come up. Uh, one, you met me at uh, an event part in New York okay. City. Yep. Many moons ago. That was, what, 2006? Somewhere around there. Yeah. I can't remember it myself. And one of the articles happens to be a best friend of mine. Oh, yeah? Who's that? Uh, Jeff McIntyre. OK. Former student and good friend. Yeah. Um, so the one thing I had about your question about your site is one of the problems I have in education, I work at the University of Vermont, okay. is I'm always directing people to the site. And if we start here now today, or as soon as your site's live, we go through the progression of how everything, you know, every article that comes up, we see it. Are you keeping in mind somebody who's, you know, five years down the road comes to it? What are they going to see? How are they going to be able to go through it? So in other words, how are we, we organizing the content, making it searchable, and, and yeah. making it so that you can quickly get to stuff? Is that? You know, or, or like, where should they start sometimes? I guess. OK, so kind of the, the starting point, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right, so the question for the, uh, the recording at home is that um, you know, how, how do we take care of, see if I'm paraphrasing this correctly, for, for somebody coming to the site when we you know, potentially have hundreds of articles you know, five years from now, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, how will they find the information? Where do they start? Um, really, I, I don't know that we've, we've thought a whole lot about that yet. Right now, we're mainly organizing content by topic, so that if you were particularly interested in accessibility, for instance, um, we can kind of shunt you down the road of, of accessibility. Um, 
but I think more so than, than that, what we're expecting is that um, things like the Interact framework, um, things like the webstandards.org site, um, and other sites will actually kind of point to content on the Sherpa site to give very focused examples. We could potentially see the W3C doing the very same thing, saying, you know, here's, here's the spec, and perhaps in the implementation guide saying, you know, here are some examples that actually show how you would take existing markup and upgrade it to use this new feature. Okay, so that's kind of part of, part of what we're hoping to see come about as we continue to, to make more and more, to generate more and more content. Um, is that this becomes kind of the place that people point to for new stuff. And then, of course, we've got search and things like that. Um, there may come a point where we start putting together guides um, down the road where, you know, to, to kind of ease your way into a particular topic, we may, we may start creating packages or something like that. I don't know that we've thought five years ahead yet. We're still, you know, trying to get, trying to get through the first year. Um, but that's definitely something that, that we would like to, uh, to think about and like to see. Um, to see this really become a resource and kind of a living resource for you to uh, to point your point your students to and to also help us all as we you know continue in our, our professional experience um, to develop and improve. Okay, yeah, come, can you come up to the mic? I have uh, two separate questions that have. That's perfectly fine. We've got like thirty three minutes. So. <laughs> um, the first one, if you can talk a bit more about just this whole. Uh, concept of accessibility, okay. like because you briefly touched on the whole lawsuit right. issue. There's also talk of this being passed as law in the United States mm -hmm. as it is in some other countries. Yes, and it seems and it seems an issue that a lot of people who are both designers and developers are just not aware of at all. Right, and especially I come from open source. Mm -hmm. People have a tendency of using templates. Yeah, there's no such thing as accessibility in them. Mm -hmm. um, and also, separately. Um, I wonder, do you, are you guys doing outreach towards the schools that are teaching this stuff? Or are you kind of, is this like an honor system where you just wait for them to come to you? Or what's the plan? Okay. So let me take the second question first, and then I'll, I'll go back to the, the first question, um, since that one's kind of a longer one. So in term, the, the question was, are we, are we doing outreach to schools that are teaching the web in order to try and help them to, uh, to upgrade what they're teaching, in essence. Um, so yes, that's, that's part of what's happening through the Open Web Education Alliance um, and through Interact as a, as a kind of uh, project of the Web Standards Project. Um, so what they've been doing is, in addition to putting out the curriculum and partnering with other organizations that are put, putting out curriculum, um, like Opera has its own curriculum as well that they've been working on. Um, you know, together they are doing outreach um, in some cases directly to universities, uh, particular programs. In some cases, they're also working on kind of pilot programs at specific universities. So University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, um, which is where I live, um, Leslie Jensen Inman runs the web program there, and she's been very involved in, the, in, inter, excuse me, in Interact. Um, so she's been kind of developing that program, and there's thought of, you know, what, it, what is the future of the web in higher ed looking like? Um, from our discussions about this, what we would like to actually see is a school of web, basically, or a school of web science, or, or something of that nature, because, you know, very much like the school of law or the school of architecture, um, the web draws from a lot of different areas. You've got kind of the design aspects of the web, you have the, the kind of computer, traditional computer science aspects of the web, um, and then you have kind of this whole user experience and um, human computer interaction area, and it all kind of comes together. So it's a very kind of, I don't know, to be really good at, at working on the web, you almost need exposure to that, that whole circle of, of topics. Um, and in most universities, the web program is either under the art department or under the computer sciences department. And, you know, because of that, in a lot of cases, they're not, the students are not getting the exposure to the other aspects of what it takes to become a web designer um, in the world of the web today. So through the pilot programs that we've got, um, one at UTC, um, it's also Interact Curriculum, as well as the, the Interact book that uh, New Writers Peach Pit put out, 
um, are actually being used at um, Georgia Tech in their master's program. Uh, I think it's, I don't remember if it's one of the MBA programs, um, but anyway, they're, they're starting to use it in their, their master's program for like web tech related stuff. So even people who are looking to go into the management end of you know, the web are being exposed to coding practices and to web standards so that they know how to communicate because that's, you know, that's one of the most important things that, that we need as a, as a skill when we're building websites is the ability to communicate. If your designers and developers can't talk to one another, there's gonna be a lot of, uh, a lot of friction and stuff isn't gonna get built as, as well as it could potentially get built. Um, so kind of the, the two things are, are you know, the outreach to schools and giving them the opportunity to, you know, to expose them to this content via um, web conf or like conferences about education and web, as well as you know, direct outreach to, to particular schools, and then the pilot programs is, is another aspect of it. Um, and it's not limited just to higher education. We've actually um, got a couple people who are working on high school and even earlier um, middle school and such, and even elementary in some cases, uh, trying to expose students to web. Um, so that's kind of cool stuff. All right, to the bigger topic of accessibility. Um, so how many of you are familiar with accessibility? How many of you are actively practicing making your websites accessible? Fewer of you. <laughs> All right, so accessibility, a lot of us think of it in terms of you know, a blind user coming to our site, but accessibility isn't just about catering to people with screen readers. Accessibility is really about exposing your content to as many people as possible, right? And part of that is also making your content, you know, rich and semantic and useful um, to search engines. Because Google, uh, to I believe quote Jeffrey Zeldman, is the blind billionaire. You know, Google has no idea what your site looks like. All Google knows is your markup. It doesn't know your fancy JavaScript. It doesn't know your sliders and your accordion widgets and all that sort of stuff. All it knows is your content. So in order for you to rank highly in, in Google, not only do you need links and stuff like that pointing to your site um, and good relevant content, but that content should be richly marked up. Um, I kind of use semantics um, in terms of you know, the HTML elements that you're using, um, kind of like compost. And the more you can kind of mix them into the soil that is your markup, the richer your, your content becomes and you know, the more likely you are to be able to, to have neat stuff grow out of it. Um, so it could be just using things like uh, heading levels, or it could be um, simply using titles on your anchor elements to explain to somebody what a particular link is going to, um, to give them a little bit more information. Or it could be something as simple as, you know, I'm using a, a phrase like raison d'etre, right? So I'm using a, a foreign phrase, a French phrase. I can use a definition element, which is DFN, and I can actually say, using the language attribute, this is a French phrase. So this little span of text is French. And then I can use the title attribute to say what it actually means. So I've just provided additional semantics to the page to provide context about you know, what this term is that may be unfamiliar to somebody who's reading it, who may not have the, the same exposure or the same vocabulary that I do. Um, so that's, that's kind of part of it. Another part of it is actually dealing with people who have, um, I, I tend to think of it more as you know, specific needs or requirements when accessing content. It's not that you know, they are blind, it's that they, they really need the content to be able to be read to them. But it could also be that you know, they have a specific context within, their, within which they're viewing the, the website. They could be mobile, for instance, in which case you wanna provide the best experience that you can to somebody within that context, pulling out the cruft from your website, delivering you know, just the content that it is that they're looking for. Um, things like, the, this kind of all boils down to, to kind of my core philosophy when, when I'm building websites, which is progressive enhancement. And where we start where, with everything that we do, whether it's markup, CSS, JavaScript, um, or you know, ARIA or other, other sorts of things we're adding onto our sites, uh, videos and audios, everything needs to support the content. So every, every bit of content that you need on the page in order for somebody to understand and comprehend what's on the site needs to be there. So if you are, let's say, show, or let's, let's say you're loading a page, right? If you load that page via Ajax, 
right? You, you load the main, let's say you load the frame via your standard HTTP request, but then you load all the content to that page via Ajax. What happens if somebody has JavaScript disabled or perhaps you have an error in your JavaScript that causes the content not to load as the entire Gawker Media site had uh, just a couple of, of weeks ago? Um, literally, when they launched their new framework, almost all of their sites had no content on them immediately because of a simple JavaScript error. Um, you know, when, when we start relying on technologies that are either fragile or we can't guarantee that they're actually available, we do a disservice to our users. Um, so making sure that the content that is necessary, that you want people to have exposure to on your website is actually there when they make that HTTP request. Um, and then if you need to inject extra content to make your, your extra fancy tab widget, for instance, or something like that, if you, if you need to inject that stuff, inject it with JavaScript because you know the JavaScript to run the tab widget is actually gonna be able to run so you can generate the code at that point that you need to, to do to do it. So it's all about kind of building up in layers, right? So in terms of HTML, it may be starting off with, you know, first of all, excellent content, good prose. That's the, the first step because people, people with um, cognitive disabilities or people who may have a, uh, a lower reading level than you uh, may need to access your content too. So if you're, if you're writing at this level and somebody is reading at this level, that's an accessibility issue because they, they can't understand what it is, they can't comprehend what it is that you're writing. So the first step is making sure that your prose is actually usable and good. Um, then the next step is, is applying appropriate semantic elements in order to uh, enrich that content and ex expose the users to more information. And then perhaps the next step would be microformats, for instance. Uh, I believe Emily Lewis gave a talk yesterday about microformats. Um, so you could be adding additional semantics to expose somebody's uh, contact information or an event date that can be directly exported to iCal or to your Google Calendar. Um, and then, so that's the kind of the markup end. And then, you know, maybe your CSS gets applied mobile first, for instance, so that, you know, you're ensuring that even old generation mobile phones can access the content and, and get it in a nice way. And then you can, you know, do maybe a tablet layout. And perhaps some of this is done via media queries or, or other mechanisms. Um, and then you could have maybe a full width layout that is slightly different. Each of them could have you know, more and more uh, columns based on the, the amount of space that you have available to you. Um, and then on the JavaScript end, actually making sure that your, you know, let's say your various widgets that you want to load onto, into a given page, that they are all somewhat independent. You know, whether, whether they're object oriented or not, each of those widgets do not rely on the other widgets in order to run so they can kind of be delivered a la carte. So you end up with, you know, let's say one person may only be able to interact with the, uh, the tab interface, but somebody else can get the tab interface and perhaps a slider widget you have in your form. Um, and there are a lot of ways that you can do really cool stuff. Um, if you have a chance to look into the filament group, they actually do a lot of work with accessible widgets. Um, they actually work with the J jQuery UI um, and do, they've actually made those ARIA compliant, I believe for the most part, if not all of them. Um, so for instance, they'll take something like a select box, you know, select dropdown, um, or two select dropdowns and convert that via JavaScript into a slider widget that you can then, uh, then use. So that degrades nicely for a user that does not have JavaScript available. They've still got something that they can interact with. So does that give you a kind of a better picture of how, how accessibility works? All right, great. That was kind of long-winded, probably about 10 minutes, <laughs> 10 minute answer there. Um, yes. How do you select your sites that you're going to um, okay. target? That's and, a great question. Um, there's so many topics that need to be uh, discussed with this kind of stuff. Um, how are you going to get more people involved to add to your team to get those topics addressed? OK. So two questions, the first of which is, how do we pick the sites that we're, we're doing, that we're reviewing? Um, the first batch that we did, because we hadn't publicly launched the site yet, were actually chosen by the individual Sherpas. So I picked Twitter, and, and, um, and Jared picked the Snow Dragon site, et cetera. Um, but what we want is we actually want you guys to submit your own work to us. Um, you know, we're, we promise to be gentle. Uh, we're not looking to tear you down. You know, it's not, it's not like a, uh, an art school critique where we want to make you cry. 
um, we actually want to say, okay, here are things you're doing really well, and here are ways that you can improve what you're doing to make it even better. Because it's, it's not about tearing you down, it's about making us all better at what we do. Um, so for instance, like the, the last article that I wrote for it was actually about American Express, um, their login forms, and they have quite a few different login forms to the, to the, um, the service, and a lot of them look very different. Um, and they actually use completely different markup. And in some cases, they're doing things like wrapping legend elements around each of the individual um, fields and their label. So they're using the, and the weird thing was they, they kept using the, uh, the legend of login to American Express Online Services or something like that in each case. Um, so to me, I looked at that and I was like, okay, they're really, they're, they're, they understand that they should be using um, the, le the legend and the field set, that these are very helpful organizational tools for forms, but they're kind of missing the fact that the legend and the field set don't function in the way that they think it does. It doesn't need to wrap each element um, and its label. Um, so in that case, kind of broke it down and said, you're in the right direction, but you're just kind of misunderstood the way that it should be applied. So kind of, kind of that sort of a setup is, is what we're looking to do and then kind of gently nudge you in the right direction and then kind of continue on from there. So anyway, we're looking for you guys to submit, to go back to your first question, looking for you guys to, to submit your own work to us. Um, please only your own work. Um, and what we'll do is as we accept the submissions, we may get back to you with additional questions, um, but actually the submission form on Web Standard Sherpa, um, which actually I can pull up for you guys here, um, we ask a bunch of different questions. Fine, there we go. All right, so if you go to submit a site, and, oh, I am not connected to the internet apparently. All right, if you did go to a, submit a site, let me go from a, I'll run from my local version here. Haha. All right, so if you run, if you, uh, if you log into the site, which you can log in with your Twitter account or Facebook account or what have you, you don't have to create a, an account on our site, but we do ask that you uh, submit your contact information so they can follow up with questions. Um, but we'll ask for the URL, and you can even give a specific place in your content using an, an anchor, for instance. So um, let's say you wanted us to examine the, the header of your site and it had an ID of header, you can actually include that in the URL, and we'll know that you want us to focus on that specific area. Um, and then you can kind of give us some general pointers as to you know, what you're interested in us talking to you about or looking at and examining. We don't guarantee that that's what we're gonna talk about because there may be something else that jumps out at us and says, you need to talk about this. But we'll use that as kind of a general guideline for figuring out what it is that we're gonna talk about. Um, and then we ask some, some background information as well. So we wanna know a little bit about your audience um, we want to know what the goals of your website are because all of this sort of background information will help us make decisions because in a lot of cases, it depends, right? Um, especially in the case of user experience stuff. It depends on the, the context. It depends on the situation what the right approach might be, okay? So this kind of helps us narrow that down. Um, and then if you want to let us know that your site's in Esperanto or something like that, you can let us know that as well. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll kind of gather that information, we go over that with our group of Sherpas, and then have them pick out what it is that they want to, uh, what they want to review, what they want to touch on, and we'll get back in touch with you and let you know that it's gonna publish on next date. So, and we promise not to be cruel. <laughs> um, so the second question is how are, how are we gonna amass all of this content and, and get it out there to the world, right? Is that basically it in a nutshell? Um, so the plan right now is we've got, we've got five Sherpas that we launched with, um, and we may be adding a few more, but the idea is that we would have them run ac in actual rotations. So we would have a given Sherpa for a three to six month period that they would be working on perhaps one article a month or every you know, five weeks in the, in the case of having five Sherpas. Um, and then we would rotate through that way and then bring in a new crop of Sherpas so that we're getting additional perspectives and we're getting people who focus in different areas so that we're not you know, constantly trudging down the same paths over and over again so that we're not you know, perhaps skewing more towards the accessibility end and less towards you know, how to main, make more maintainable JavaScript, which coincidentally Andrew will be talking about tomorrow. Plug, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> so, 
um, you know, how, how you can improve the speed and efficiency of your JavaScript or something like that. We want to make sure that it, it, we don't end up lopsided in our content, so we'll be rotating through the, the Sherpas that we're doing um, in hopes of, of broadening what it is that we're actually talking about. Okay, does that answer your question pretty well? Any other questions? We've got 15 minutes left. Anything? Yes, please come up. Got to run from all the way over there. Do you know if Google Analytics or any other uh, analytic tools track screen readers, or how can we detect whether or not there are any of our customers using our sites that use this, these assistive technologies? OK, that's a really good question, actually. Um, so far as I know, uh, so the question was, are, are Google Analytics and other tracking software actually um, divulging information about how many users are coming to a site with, with screen reader technology um, or other assistive tech? Um, to my knowledge, the only technology that gives you access to whether or not a screen reader is currently running on your site um, is Flash. Um, it does expose it, and I think some people had been using Flash in order to make that determination, and then um, Flash and JavaScript can talk to one another, so Flash can pass back that information to JavaScript, and JavaScript can log it. So I don't know if Google Analytics is doing that. I have not seen it in Google Analytics. Um, but if not, they really should. It would be helpful information to have. It's, it's kind of like, I don't know, for a long time, it, they've kind of found ways around it now, but for a long time, in terms of the analytics world, you couldn't actually tell how many people were using JavaScript who came to your site because the only analytics you got back was from people who were using JavaScript. They needed JavaScript in order to record the analytics, so it always skewed towards everybody having JavaScript. Um, so you know, kind of run into the, the same sort of issue with accessibility in terms of we don't know who, for instance, is using a, uh, a touch feedback device, which you know, outputs Braille so that you can run your finger along and, and read the page with your finger rather than having it spoken to you, um, or who is using an embossed printer, which, which prints Braille for you. Um, we don't know how many people are printing sites to be read offline. Um, you know, some of the, I imagine as, as things progress and we start to see more Instapapers and readabilities and stuff like that, I imagine analytics will start tracking how many of your articles are being sent to those sorts of um, services, um, in which case they might also start looking at, at what other um, alternative media um, your site is being used with, um, which is what, in the case of like Braille printers and, and such, um, what's happening. Um, I do know that if you want more control over um, how your, your content is read, for instance, um, there are tools out there that you can, can use, not only to, to debug and stuff like that and to, to listen to how your content is read, um, but there are third-party services that you can use to actually create audio versions of your pages or even create podcasts from your blog posts, um, which is pretty sweet. Um, I'm forgetting what the, the names are off the top of my head, but I'm, I'm sure if you were interested, I can dig up a few links uh, from my bookmarks. Um, and some of them are free and some of them uh, cost a little bit of money. But you can even control things like, you know, you want all of your paragraphs let out, read out by um, a woman between the ages of like 30 and 35, or something like that, from the right hand side of the uh, from the right hand side of the audio spectrum, or, or something like that. Or you want, you know, all of your list items. Hey, um, you want all of your list items to uh, to be read out by a child. You could control that with uh, with a lot of the audio voice stuff. Um, all right. Any other questions? Or do you guys want to break for dinner? All in favor of breaking for dinner? All right. Thank you all very much. If you'd like to get a Web Standard Sherpa button, I have two different designs, one of which includes uh, Shirley, our mountain goat Sherpa uh, mascot. Um, I'd be happy to, uh, to give them out to you. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for coming and uh, postponing dinner to come and listen to me uh, speak about the Sherpa site. And definitely go check it out, and please submit your work. Thank you very much.